please subscribe and don't forget to press the bell icon to get notified whenever we upload a new video. Welcome back. Well, on to earnings now. Tata Motors reported what was a weak set of numbers post markets yesterday. Weakness in JLR impacted profitability and losses for the standalone business also continued. Sonia is here this morning to give us the highlights. Sonia. Well, thanks for that. I expect the stock to open in the red today. That's because the uh, not only were the numbers below what the street was estimating, both on the Jaguar Land Rover as well as the standalone front, the management commentary was also quite cautious. They say that uh, weakness continues in key markets like UK, Europe, etc. Uh, China is the only market which is looking like a bright spot right now. Stripped of that, all the other markets are looking like they could be under further pressure. So I expect the stock to be in the red. Remember, the Jaguar Land Rover business has seen further deterioration as funds are concerned. Uh, this time the margins fell 220 basis points year on year at 12.2 percent this of course was the reported number adjusted of all the one-offs and the forex expenses etc it was still 13 and a half percent margins much below the average that they have done for the last many years um, the the uh, PBT for the company also fell by about 46 odd percent this time around not just that the standalone business losses continue the standalone margins were also below what the street was estimating this despite uh, you know uh, the the cycle being on the upswing in the commercial vehicle space. So there are a lot of questions that remain to be answered in the standalone business as well. Now, what the company has done is they have changed their cost capitalization policy. Uh, they would like to align it to some of the global peers like BMW, etc. And because of that, there will be a hundred basis points immediate impact on their standalone, on their Jaguar Land Rover margins, and the standalone margins will have an impact as well. They did give a long-term guidance of seven to nine percent EBIT uh, on a Jaguar Land Rover, but one wonders since they don't have too much of a demand push, there's no volume push. What kind of cost-cutting initiative? initiatives would be needed to achieve that kind of you know a guidance so the guidance also looks a bit unachievable at the moment I just want to pull up one graph which is the annual trend of Jaguar Land Rover margins they closed FY18 with 10.8 percent margins a far uh, cry from you know the, uh, uh, the 17 18 percent margins they used to enjoy way back in FY14 and FY15 so um, uh, challenging times for Tata Motors Absolutely, so you know, challenging times for Tata Motors. The stock has uh, fallen about 30% from the start of this year, also sitting at a 52-week low. Hang in there, we'll come back to you for Jet Airways. But before we do that, our colleague Kevin Lee, he caught up with the president uh, of the passenger vehicle business of Tata Motors, along with the president of the CV business of the same. Let's listen into that conversation and we get back, tell you what Jet Airways did. I think we have a very robust uh, pipeline, Kevin. Uh, See, so typically even with our new launches, we had four launches in the last uh, two years, we cover only about 60 and going forward our aim is that by 2020 at least 90% of the market we should cover. Yes, going forward in this year we'll have Harrier which we showed at the Auto Expo that will be launched uh, towards the end of the year. Speaking a little bit about rising raw material costs and just juxtaposing that against the fact that crude is again above $80 a barrel, fuel prices have been going up, petrol and diesel, both analysts are saying crude could touch $100 a barrel which would have an adverse impact again on fuel prices. What is the demand scenario looking like for the next six months? Yeah, Kevin, I've been in this business for over two decades and I've never seen any year where everything is positive. Mm. So let's see a balance sheet, positives and negatives. Positives, yes, economy is doing good. Uh, infrastructure construction is, I think, decent. Uh, monsoon is predicted to be good. Last year it was good. So I think these are ballpark good positives. Concern-wise, yes, uh, I think fuel prices is a concern. $80 or uh, you saw Delhi, I mean, how the prices of fuel are going up, that's a concern. Mm -hmm. Inflation and uh, interest rates could be a cause of concern. So as manufacturers, uh, we have to uh, strike a balance, find our own ways. And uh, I think despite all this, I stick to that 8% growth which CIM has projected. I think it should grow like that. I think over uh, last one year, while the entire market went up by 21%, uh, we grew by 23% and as a result, uh, after a market share decline for almost 7-8 years, we have been able to not only arrest that, but we have been able to grow the market share by 0.7%. Mm. Within that, we have grown the market share in the intermediate and light commercial vehicle by 2.7%, in small commercial vehicle by 2.1% and in the passenger vehicle by 1.1%. So overall, I must say throughout the year, good market share performance. Uh, in addition to that, uh, I think although we went into BS4, uh, which was one major transition, uh, we have been able to improve our margins also uh, through a lot of uh, efforts on cost reduction. So I think overall it has been 
a good year for us. What does the turnaround 2.0 mean specifically for the CV segment in terms of the number of launches that we could see in FI19 versus FI18? Yeah, so I think uh, we will have multiple launches. See, Tata Motors CV has a very wide portfolio. Hmm. And if you look at FI18, including the variants, we had almost more than 70 launches. And uh, there are many more launches planned for this year. So you would have seen a glimpse of that in the Auto Expo when we unveiled some of the products. Hmm. We are quite excited, looking forward. Uh, there are a lot of uh, new products in the pipeline, which will help us to improve our market share. Okay, well, Jet Airways also posted what was a weak set of earnings this quarter and uh, there were some auditor notes as well. Sonia, take us through the highlights. Well, yes, you know, the core numbers for Jet Airways are very disappointing this time around. It was a huge loss of 1,045 crores that the company posted. This was the profit same time last year and the expectations of a profit. So definitely the stock is going to react on the downside. The revenue growth was also less than expected. Remember, uh, uh, we were expecting the uh, revenue growth to be somewhere to the tune of 9 to 10 odd percent. It came in at, uh, uh, about, uh, we were expecting about, you know, high teens revenue growth for the company, considering that the passenger traffic growth was also in high teens. But this time around, they saw revenue growth of just about 9-odd percent or so. Now, they did mention in their press release that the Q4 results were adversely impacted because of fuel expenses. Fuel expenses have gone up by 30 percent for them at 2,063-odd crores. There was a forex loss as well they had to incur to the tune of 156-odd crores. And they had a one-time maintenance charge that hit them to the tune of 253-odd crores. Uh, yes, the auditors have raised concerns with regards to, you know, the ability of the company to raise funds to meet its financial uh, support. They've also said they have concerns with respect to the company's ability to generate cash flows to meet uh, their obligations. But this is something that they have done in the past as well. The debt for Jet Airways has been piling up and that it continues to be a concern in terms of higher interest costs as well. If you look at FY18 as a whole, uh, the revenues have grown to 24,500 crores but the real problem is the bottom line. They ended FY18 with a big loss of 634 odd crores versus a profit of 1400 crores same time last year. Back to you. All right, Sonia, thanks a lot for that. We will keep an eye out on how that one uh, fares in trade today. But Natco, that one reported a good, uh, good performance, Ekta? Yes, absolutely. You know, uh, any which way the street estimates with regards to the margins were over 50 odd percent, but you can't fault the company coming in at 49 right. percent. It was still a very good set of numbers that they reported. So the revenue was up around 33 odd percent to 767 crores. Margins, like I mentioned, came in at 50 percent versus 42 percent. EBITDA growth of 59 percent for the quarter and a profit of around 300 odd crores. Now, remember that Natco has a couple of these launches in the U.S. market that they benefited from. So, for example, Tammy flew generic because they did benefit from the fact that the U.S. had a very, very bad flu season. So, there was a lot of requirement for the for drugs such as Tammy flu generic. So, companies such as Natco Pharma as well as Cadilla are expected to benefit this quarter. Separately, uh, drugs such as Copaxone Generic, which is basically for multiple cirrhosis, mm -hmm. should be adding in terms of the U.S. portfolio. So overall, because of these kind of drugs, they did uh, see a good set of numbers come through. But how did the U.S. business do X of uh, these drugs and what kind of guidance they have in FI19 would be important to note. And that will only come out at uh, 11 a.m. today during the conference call. So I suspect that the street should be happy with these numbers. But again, it depends on the commentary later. Absolutely. The, how it depends on the commentary. That was Natco Pharma stock ended at the high point of the day yesterday. But one stock which ended at the low point of trade yesterday fell from record highs was Pidilite. Remember, today are the numbers. And there you can see it, it fell about 4% from the highs, ended at the low point of the day. The street is expecting a good set of numbers. The stock is virtually at the record high despite some sell-off in the last hour yesterday. We're expecting a revenue growth of 13% come by on the maker of Fevicol. EBITDA is likely to grow by 15%. Remember, this may sound counterintuitive given the sharp surge we've seen in crude as well as crude derivatives. However, margins are likely to improve by about uh, 40 basis points. Net profit, as a result of that, seen higher by 26 Seven percent. The domestic consumer volume business uh, volume growth is seen at around 11 to 12 percent. So 13 percent revenue growth, 11 to 12 percent volume growth is what the street is factoring in. Remember, now they do not have uh, the benefit of an adverse base as they did in third quarter. FI7 had about 8.2 uh, percent volume growth. On the back of that, we're expecting an 11 to 12 percent volume growth. The gross margins they may see a decline given uh, the high hike that we've seen in crude prices as well as input prices. Uh, VAM prices are up about 20% year on year. 
but uh, higher revenue as well as cost cutting may save the companies a bit. I remember for all the large players, organized players, inflationary uh, environment is better as compared to the unorganized players. We'll watch out for management commentary on recovery in domestic growth, competition environment. Yesterday, Astral Poly reported a good growth in their adhesive segment and new products and growth in the waterproofing business, especially given the fact that that market is growing and a normal monsoon is predicted. But uh, with that, we'll take a short break, come back. And uh, up next, we'll get you leaders of at least 14 political parties attended H.D. Kumar Swami's swearing in yesterday. More on that. On to some earnings expected. United Spirits will be in focus today ahead of its numbers. Remember, usually the numbers come post markets and the stock and the consumers react on Friday. But Sonal is here to take us through all the key expectations. Morning, Sonal. Good morning, Manglam. And you know, we are expecting good set of numbers this time around on a YY and on a sequential basis. In terms of revenue on a YY basis, we are expecting a growth of around 3.2%, a bit of growth of 11.5%, and margin expansion of around 140 basis points. But profits is where we are expecting strong growth of around 65 odd percent. The main thing that we will be watching out for will be the volumes. However, this time around, we are expecting a decline of 9% in volumes on the uh, on the back of uh, low end franchising impact. Also remember last quarter the management had told us there has been route to market changes in various states and that is one thing that will lead to declining uh, volumes. Also premiumization and recent hike that the company has taken might just offset it a bit and that's why EBITDA is expected to be on the higher end. Molasses prices has decreased sharply in last one year and that is something that we'll be looking out for. What is the impact of raw material prices on the results this time around? I, uh, volume growth under prestige and above segment is another thing that we are looking out for closely. Management had been very bullish in the con call last time around. They said that they expect mid to high teens growth in terms of volumes and revenues. So management commentary tomorrow will be, ha will be watched closely. Uh, but we'll have to see how the stock reacts before the results are out. Okay. Sonal, what do you expect from Gale? A good set of numbers are expected, Ekta, and especially on the operational front, majorly led by the LPG and the uh, pet chem business. In terms of revenue, they are expected to be flat at 14,400 crore rupees. EBITDA, however, is expected to expand by 7.5%, leading to a margin expansion of 140 basis points. Now, there are three segments in this particular business. Transmission segment, we are expecting sequential moderation in the grass, uh, gas transmission volumes. That is because LNG import had been higher, but domestic gas production had been weaker. But EBITDA is expected to expand by around 6% sequentially. The other uh, segment that we'll be talking about is the LPG segment, where the volumes are expected to, uh, grow, on a strong, uh, uh, to grow strongly, uh, up 22% YOY and 6% on a sequential basis. LPG realizations have also been strong this time around. So we'll look out for what sort of, sort of growth does this segment really give us. Pet chem uh, segment, strong per performance is expected. And in fact, it is expected to be a turnaround quarter for this, uh, for this particular segment. And the other key things that we'll be watching out for is the pet chem profitability and also progress of pipeline projects that the company had been talking about since quite some time. All right, Sonal, thanks a lot for that. Uh, with that, we'll move on to some corporate commentary. Speaking with the NBC TV 18's Ashmit Kumar, the global CEO of ABB, Ulrich Spicehofer, he speaks about the need to privatize power utilities, also how the company has developed a fast charging solution for electrical vehicles. Listen in. On the transmission side, I think the government has made significant strides forward and is going in the right direction. On the distribution side, you really see a big uh, difference between different players. You have some privatized players that have done tremendously well, have a good capital structure and investing in future technology. And so you have some others that are not yet there. Mm -hmm. And to make sure that in the future, e-mobility, mm -hmm future uh, digitalized factories are happening, mm -hmm. we need reliable distribution level power supply. Mm -hmm. So therefore, yes, it might be a good idea to consider mm -hmm. moving also the other distribution assets in a business model where you have more, more performance, better service, and a better capital structure going forward. We are not telling the government what to do in terms of privatization, not privatization, but what we see is that certain business models have an advantage being used. We have solved the charging issue. Mm -hmm. The charging issue was we need safe mm -hmm. and we need fast charging that is available everywhere. ABB just recently, a couple of weeks ago, in the presence of Chancellor Merkel of Germany, we launched a new world record charging solution mm -hmm. where we can charge an electric car for 200 kilometers in eight minutes. Take off will start at the bottom of the S curve and then it accelerate over time. If you look at the availability of solutions for fleets, for example, 
on electric three-wheelers, light commercial vehicles that will be electrical, having an electrical propulsion. It's really mind-boggling what's coming. And I think what we're going to see in the next couple of years, we see every year we will see a multiplication of the existing fleet. Yes, it will take a while until we have a certain percentage, but the momentum will be solid. Let's get back to what's happening in the global space. It seemed to be quite a risk-off when it especially came to the currency space. Turkey's central bank intervened to halt what was the free fall of the Turkish currency, the Turkish lira, last night. But uncertainty still persists if policymakers can stave off a full-fledged currency crisis. The central bank of the Republic of Turkey raised its late liquidity window lending rate, basically lending rates, points in a surprise move that put a halt to the lira sell-off. All right, we'll keep an eye out on uh, developments there and in emerging market, market currencies. But uh, for all the updates from the commodities arena, we have Manisha Gupta as always. Morning, Manisha. Hi, morning. Thank you so much for that. Well, we'd want to start with the crude prices yet again because we have seen some pressure come in on that. And this is because on the back of the crude inventories, where the markets were expecting a draw, but you saw a buildup of 5.8 million barrels, and that really seems to be putting some pressure on the prices. Also, as we have been talking, it is about the OPEC meeting and that they may decide to raise oil output when they meet on 22nd of June is what really is, uh, you know, keeping the markets quite choppy. Other important number to watch is that the hedge funds have been cutting long positions on crude, and they are down by nearly 10 percent in the last seven weeks. $80 a barrel has attracted a lot of selling. Not too many people see that the prices will go beyond that or sustain above that. So that really seems to be leading to some profit taking into the markets. In any case, you have seen the crude oil prices gain up by 48% in the last 12 months, and the funds have been holding high at record long positions. So they really seem to be coming out of this number. Another one last important number that I want to put across is that the first quarter revenue from uh, many investment banks in their commodities as an asset class has shown a big jump up. And this basically comes in on the back of energy. So with crude, power, gas, this is what has led to strong revenues for many of these global investment banks. All right, uh, Manisha, thanks a lot for that. Let's shift focus back to the FNO space then, the equities market. And we're getting a lot of bearish cues come by from the FNO space. Remember, the SEX Nifty is indicating a mildly green tick. So it'll be very interesting to see whether the shorts are getting follow through or not. Just a look at the Nifty Futures premium, which fell from 22 to 14, all the way down to a discount yesterday. At the low end of trade, we saw some more selling. The FII selling in index futures continues relentlessly. Over the last four sessions, they've sold almost 4,000. 1,500 crores in index futures. Yesterday was the largest of that 1,750 crore worth selling. In the last three sessions, they added roughly seven shots and unwound one long contract in index futures, close to 34,000 shots added. And what this does is a dramatic turn of events. At the start of the series, the FIs were 54% long, and now they are 54% short. So we need to know whether there is more follow-through ahead of the expiry week or not. Uh, the put-call ratio, which uh, indicates uh, how many more puts have been written as against calls, has come in favor of the calls now. So a lot of call writing seen at uh, levels of 10,500, 10,400, as well as 10,450. We saw some put writing at the 10,400 put yesterday, and uh, the 10,600 600 and 10,500 puts saw some uh, open interest being shed. Keep an eye out on the weekly options expiry for the Nifty Bank. About uh, 200 points on the downside and 100 points on the upside is where the maximum open interest is and where the maximum uh, calls are and puts are added. Watch out for Jet Airways, comes out of FNO Band post week set of numbers and Just Isle 2. So those are two, two stocks I'll be watching out for. Okay.